today and thank you FNP for hosting this webinar. Um, so welcome everyone today uh, to the top tips for effective data management strategy. Today we're going to talk about different ways in which you can not only manage but also utilize this data. Um, as always, we would like to start off today with our um, forward-looking statement uh, to make sure that you make your purchasing decisions on Salesforce solution based on currently available product. The reason why we mention it today is because we are focused on different ways in which you can manage the data, but we'll also be using some of our solutions as an example. And everything that we'll be talking about and referencing to today is currently available. But if it does come up in the Q&A in terms of our future product and future releases, we will make sure to point it out as well. We would also like to say thank you to everyone for your attendance today. It is afternoon time for some of the people, so hopefully you've already had your snack or maybe got something with you uh, right now to watch this webinar while you eat. Um, and also all the work that you do in the fundraising organizations. Yang and I have been with the nonprofit and with the fundraising background as well. So it is really great to be able to collaborate with organizations like yourself and to be able to discuss this topic with you. Just as an introduction um, for those who haven't Met me. My name is Brenda Wei. I'm a solution engineer at Salesforce. I have been with the organization for over three years now and been with nonprofit teams since. I like to consider myself as born and bred Salesforce nonprofit. Um, fun fact about me is that I have built a house in Cambodia with an organization called Volunteer Building Cambodia. This is part of the volunteering um, opportunity that Salesforce offers as well. And it's always great to do some of these hands-on activity. Um, coming from engineering background and in combination with things that um, these organizations do, it's such a great experience that I have for myself. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Yang to do a quick introduction before we move on to our agenda. Thank you, Brando. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. So I am um, Yang Yang, but you know everyone knows me by Yang. Uh, I've been with Salesforce a little bit over a year now, uh, but I've been working uh, in the uh, technology space within the fundraising industry for over nine years. And really high level, a little fun fact about myself, I once wore a Wallaby onesie for a whole week for a P2P fundraising campaign. Great. Well, thank you, Yang. That's one thing that I did not know. So it's always good to hear new and learn new information about our colleagues. Um, all right. So for today's topic, we'll have divided into three parts. And as Fiona mentioned previously as well, there will be resources relating to all of these topics on the slides that we'll be sharing with you at the end. Um, but today, what we want to focus on is just starting off with how you can keep your data clean. We'll think, we will look into ways that things that you need to consider as you enter your data within your current system and different ways in which you can standardize them. We're going to then move on to how to be clever with this data that exists within your system, things such as segmentation, insights, and what are the things that you can start to do to drive your fundraising activity. And lastly, we're going to conclude it with managing this data policy and governance side of things. So who is responsible for it? What are some of the things that you can do? Which team and committee that you can form to be able to manage all of this data within your organization? So the reason why this is important is that we want to start off with, in, in usually in organizations, um, the lack of good data, having silo data and incomplete data means you can't really rely on them to make decisions, whether it be because of the duplicate, because you're not sure whether they are up to date. So this untrusted data provides um, a huge impact, not only on your supporters and donor, but also the experience of your staff member and your team as well, as well as some of the campaign performance that you wanna offer. And with that as well, there is an increased cost that come to it, whether it be maintaining the system, maintaining some of these duplicates and cleaning it up, extra work hour and resources that are required to make sure that you manage these um, data correctly. Based on our nonprofit trends report that conducted over a thousand of nonprofit employees across the world, only 34% reported making decisions based on the data and evidence, as well as they only use that to design programs and services. So there is an area of improvement that can be done across the nonprofit organization to ensure we engage with our supporters and any other um, stakeholders um, effectively. And the way that we do it is by ensuring that we are managing this data effectively. So starting off with how we can keep these data clean and reduce all these inefficiency and improve the experience. So let's talk about how we can manage all the data that comes into your system right now. So there are two parts of it that we want to talk about. First one is to take only what you need. Whether you have been using the same system for many years, or maybe you recently work across a new system or have different, um, several um, maybe spreadsheets, different um, systems that are out there that you're using right now, it is important for you to identify what is important for you to keep and where all of this data can sit. 
Why? It's because it helps you reduce the data clutter as well as improve the user experience. You do need to review it from time to time um, in terms of your database and what kind of information you're keeping right now. But ultimately, the purpose is to make sure that you are selective of what you keep within the system and what's the use for it. The second part of the keeping the data clean is about standardizing them. In the end, it is about making the reporting easier for you by having the correct type of data. As a fundraising organization, it is important that the contact details are up to date and valid. It's also important that we are able to reach out to our donors as from the channels that they prefer, whether it be a direct mail, email, phone number, and we need to make sure that these are all up to date. And the result of it is to be able to provide with effective segmentation, whether it be based on the area, state, suburbs, for example, by having the right address details, or maybe contacting our donor to the right channel through the email and the phone numbers that are valid and available. Let's dive into each of these topics specifically. So when we talk about take only what you need, what are the type of data that you need to consider and what are the potential approach that you might want to have a look at? First of all is the CRM data. So these are must have for you. Right now within your organization, think of some of this information you have about your donors and supporters, contact details, demographic data, interests, um, the origination, why would they support you? These are some of these information that will be useful in running your fundraising activities and campaigns and also being able to keep track of these information. These are the ones that you must have that sits within your system itself. Now, second part is the non-CRM transactional data. Think of it as some of this financial transaction. You don't need to bring every single thing from your accounting system within your CRM, right? But you do need to make sure where all of these campaigns and appeals align to. And these are the non-transactional CRM data that you might want to manage in different systems of record instead of keeping everything in one go. Then we do have the non-CRM additional data. So these are the ones that will offer you insights. And sometimes you might need to draw trends and provide a report. Maybe you might want to offer some of the impact report to some of your donors. And this is where you use analytics tool that can bring all of this data together, but not necessarily um, something that you would need in your day-to-day -day, um, appeals or when you communicate with your donors themselves. So these are the non-CRM additional data. Then last but not least is the historical data. A lot of the organizations would have been around for quite some time. We would have so much data that sits within the system right now, some of which you may not necessarily need anymore. So it could be some of the past initiative and campaigns that you ran. The insights are useful for you, but not necessarily all, the, all down to the details of what it is. You may want to keep the output and results so that you can go and review some of these performance, but the rest can be archived. So all of these comes down to different types of data and approaches that you can take. So one of the things to consider um, as well is that as you look into your current organization system, what's really important, what's a core must have data, what is additional, um, and then keep track of all of these. Within Salesforce, the way we manage this through having across different um, solutions and features that are available, whether it be keeping them in your current CRM itself, whether it be connecting through um, the open API that we have or one of the new soft composer tools that we have. We also offer analytics tool that help you connect with the external data to provide you with insights on the additional type or whether it be different archiving solutions that exist within our partner ecosystem and our marketplace itself as well. If you're interested in learning more about these, there is a really great blog article that is linked here on the slide um, that will be shared with you later on. Now let's talk about standardizing them. Now that we know which data sits within the CRM, let's talk about a way to keep them clean. First of all is to define the data type. When you create a new field, when you're thinking about, I want to collect um, one of the information about a donor, you need to start thinking about what type of data you want to have. For example, one of the commonly asked questions would be um, asking, how do you find, how did you find out about our organization? It can be a pick list rather than a text field, a free text field where everyone can fill in their detail, mainly because we want to make sure that in the end, when we report on it, it's easy for us to define instead of trying to figure out the texts that are written in those forms. Um, and second part of it is to creating the validation. As you would have many different users, you would have the system set up. We want to make sure that the data fits the right criteria that you put in. For example, I don't want to, I don't want some of my users to be able to update the major gift status without properly prospecting one of our prospective donor. And at the same time, this ensures by having this validation, it ensures accurate forecasting as well. Then we look into some of these contact details, such as addresses. 
when you write your addresses within your system, do you write your states and territories as NSW or New South Wales? Do you write AU, AU as Australia? All of this standardized data is to ensure, again, you can filter this correctly and be able to provide additional reports based on these locational based data. Otherwise, you can also consider using some of these address validation tools, whether if you need DPID or you need a change of address verification, there are external tools that can help connect to your database to be able to verify these addresses and improve the, deliver, the deliverability to the right donor themselves. So a lot of tips and tricks in terms of keeping the data clean, but just to summarize and in terms of what you need to consider is first take only what you need. Some of the questions you might want to ask yourself is what type of data do you have and where do they sit right now and where would they potentially sit? And then when it comes to standardizing them, what are the ways in which you are currently standardizing them to make sure it's consistent across your um, database? And how often do you need to validate these contact details so that you are sending to the right people through the right addresses that they have offered you? And with that, I'm going to hand over to Yang to then talk about how you can clever, be clever with your data. Great, thank you, Brenda. Uh, so uh, with the next slide, just want to maybe uh, questions for the audience. So I just want to engage our viewers today and just basically see a few high level things. So just have a quick look, you know, what kind of information are you currently tracking for your donors? And we're going to quickly go through some of them, you know, we're tracking date of birth, uh, you know, family, social, professional networks. So, you know, where are they donating their their money into? What campaigns or appeals are they responding to? Uh, how are we acquiring these particular donors from? Is it from, you know, email? Is it from phones and so forth? Uh, you know, the, what's the motivation behind their donation as well? Uh, and, and have they actually been a volunteer or have they attended events in the past before, be it online or virtual? As well as, you know, how, what have you actually learned about your supporter base from this information? Uh, and also, like, what, what are you actually doing with this rich source of information as well? So some of the easy wins that I've seen some organizations leveraging this data includes, you know, maybe having birthday interactions. So sending someone an email, personalized, maybe give them a phone call on their birthday, or maybe putting them into some journeys through the marketing solution that you may be using. Alternatively is maybe, you know, having a segmentation for an upcoming appeal, whereby, say, you know, you're looking for people who previously donated to, like, the Seed Lion Fund back in, you know, Christmas 2019, whatever that that motivation was, try and see if we can re-engage with them or to retain them as well. As well, at the same time as, you know, have we managed to convert volunteers or event participants into donors? So personal story, I used to volunteer, oh, I still volunteer with a nonprofit organization. And a few years later, they managed to convert me to become a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser as well as a donor as well. And yeah, so please feel free to put some information on, are we capturing some of this information today? And what other information does your organization capture that maybe others or you haven't really seen from the slides here? Uh, and uh, with that, just quickly go into the next slide, talking about, you know, segmenting the inside and in how, how Salesforce may be able to assist is, in a, for instance, looking at the nonprofit success pack. Out of the box, there's about 60 roll-up fields, which automatically updates for you as a user. So, you know, we will have the recency, the frequency, the monetary, the, the fan favorites, you know, first gift, latest gift, greatest gifts also there. Maybe the best year gift. What? How can you segment the data based on, you know, the best year giving? How can you tell a story based on that? You can also create your own as well if you need to, if the 60 out of the box doesn't really meet your needs. Another one is potentially using Einstein for nonprofits, giving you the predictions based on that rich history of information you're currently storing in your CRM. You know, with three out of the box predictions, you can have, have actually 20. So you can create 17 of your own and you can actually have 10 of them running at a particular same time. And lastly, marketing solutions. So maybe help enable you to configure set and forget marketing journeys once a donor has met a certain criteria that you would define. You know, maybe once a donor has donated three times in a month or over $5,000, what is that journey going to look like? Is it going to be automated or is it going to be something that's going to be stewarded by one of your uh, team members? And why would this be beneficial? Reason is, you know, last year we actually asked a few nonprofit marketers and fundraisers about the changes that they're experiencing in, in their work. And what we found is that organizations have rapidly adapted their fundraising efforts in response to how donors changed that behavior during the pandemic. So uh, what we're going to see is, you know, 82% of nonprofit marketers believe their ability to meet support expectations are directly tied to their digital capabilities. So I think this trend is actually going to make a lot of sense uh, when we, you know, from what we've heard from the fundraisers. And at the same time, 85% of nonprofit fundraisers believe is actually becoming more and more difficult to retain and upgrade donors. And in other words, actually becoming more difficult to meet the donor expectations.
And 69% when that loads up there, you know, 69% of organizations say they're actually unable to accurately forecast revenue from their fundraising campaign. So this is going to increase headaches, not only for the fundraisers, but also for other team members, maybe like finance, for instance, that the, the lack of a, the ability to basically kind of work cohesively. Now, of all the organizations that are actually unified and being more clever with their data in a single system during that pandemic, 89% of them uh, were basically able to make a greater impact as a result. Uh, so with that, handing over to Brenda to talk about, uh, oh, actually, we're going to both talk about it, uh, how to manage data policy. Thank you, Yang. So as Yang has already talked about as well, we looked at first of all, where how the data is going to come in and what are the things we need to consider. Yang talked about in ways in which you can be clever because the data on its own will not be really helpful unless you do something about it, whether it be segmenting, looking at the insights from there and also looking at some of these technology that can help you automate some of the processes to be able to start engaging with these um, data that you currently have. So now we're going to then talk about different ways in which you can manage it. It's think of it as, um, I'd like to use an example of cleaning your wardrobe. You can organize it once, but then you will also need to come back and review it from time to time, whether it be based on the new seasonal trends or maybe some of the clothes that you might want to donate back to, for example. And this is where we're going to talk about in this particular section is on how to manage this data policy. Again, there are two considerations that you might want to have a look at. First of all is the quality and quantity control. Relevant data, true, that is the quality data, but also it's important to think about the quantity that you currently have as well. Why? The reason is because you want to reduce the data volume. Like mentioned previously, you don't want some of these that are not necessary to sit within the CRM itself. You do want to improve the performance itself and potentially help reduce the cost by making sure you have the quality data that you can work with when it comes to being clever with them. Second part that Yang will be going through is the governance procedure. Wrapping it up with who is responsible for what, some of the people you need to involve in this process of the system and different community that you can form. Ultimately, regardless of which system and technology that you currently have or planning to go into to ensure the adoption, it's also important to work with all the stakeholders that are involved within the organization itself. And we're going to walk through what each different responsibilities are. Let's talk about quantity control first. When it comes to quantity control, there are different ways. Two of the most things would be managing duplicates and archiving. We touched on a little bit about archiving just then, but we'll look, talk more about it in, in a moment. When it comes to managing the duplicate, especially if you do have silo database, it's more likely that you have different um, same, same contact details, same donor existing within different system. So how are you currently managing some of these duplicates all, across all these different systems right now? And how do you match them? Are you looking at the first thing, last thing basis only? Are you looking at their contact details? I have maybe three to five email addresses. So how do you ensure that I am the same person that you're talking to across your email platform or your CRM or any other communication channels that you have, for example? Within Salesforce, the duplicate management comes out of the box that helps you define the criteria that you're looking for to help you reduce the admin effort and also help you with the cleaner database as well. So within your current system right now that you have, what are some of the considerations and how often are you reviewing them? Second part of it is archiving the data. When it comes to archiving, it can be as simple as extracting the data. So for example, some of the taking some of the historical data out and then bulk um, extracting them and saving them elsewhere. Or maybe you might want to look into some of the archiving solutions within this uh, within the um, ecosystem about um, to help you leverage some of these tools that are available for you. Depending on the complexity and requirements, you can take different approaches as well. And there is a blog article that linked to help you go through some of these tables and requirements on what are the things that you need to consider and what you can do with some of these data that you may want to archive. The second part of it um, itself is the quality control. So why should you care is that first, your user might be complaining about slower performance. Maybe they might be complaining about the busy look. They don't really know where some of the data that sits within your system that you need to find. And you might be approaching some of your governance limit as well. So what you can do is you, if this system, there is a report that exists, you can run an optimizer report, which is your admin's best friend, because what it does within Salesforce is that it helps you generate a list of things that you need, including the effort required, as well as the status to help you figure out what to tackle first. So within your current data, 
database and system right now? How are you currently optimizing them? And similar to the previous question, what are the criteria that you need to think about when you review them? Do you look into some of these old fields that exist? Do you use them? And are these useful for you? Do you still use them anymore? Um, or if you're a, um, if you're, if you know about Marie Kondo, it's about cleaning up and looking at what sparks joy within your database, right? And second part of it is running a health check. So this is taking the next step to improve the overall security within your org. For example, changing the minimum requirements length for your password. Maybe you might want to limit the login attempts to make sure that uh, the security is stronger, um, to make sure that the passwords are not vulnerable. So similarly within Salesforce, what you can do is to run a health check that do provide you with the base um, line um, security. And you can also see areas in which you can improve. So these are some of the ways in which technology can help you optimize your current database. But there are also responsibilities from the users as well as the um, admins, as well as the IT in terms of what you can do. And Yang will be talking about different governance procedure that you need to have and things that you can consider as part of it. Yes, and why is it important? Uh, so we've actually seen different ways to manage data, but you know, you currently have a way, you know, but do you have a current site? Do you currently have a way to track it? Uh, so uh, if we were to look at maybe from a compliance point of view, you know, the data privacy, the compliance, what needs to be considered? Uh, as well as from the risk assessment, you know, how do we want to avoid exposure of inappropriate, sorry, inappropriate risks? So do you have the technology to support these at the same time? And that's everyone's responsibility as well. You know, maybe for instance, utilizing single sign-on or don't be plugging in random USB sticks we find on the street uh, to also your IT actually setting limits as well within the organization uh, from a cost, so cost efficiency point of view, you know, clear priorities and standardization of procedures to maximize your limited resources. So you're having process procedure documents or and nonprofit organizations don't have the luxury of resource a lot of times. So how can you actually make the best use of what you have for long term as well? And that prioritization of any new initiatives and how you actually plan to adapt and also to adopt it too. Uh, also, who are the roles responsible at, at the same time? And that continuous partnership between the technology uh, supply or technology vendor and the people who run the rest of that business, that's going to be really important. Your IT and your admin to deliver and deploy uh, the system testing and support in any uh, new release schedules as well, as well as business units. So, you know, that, that has a project vision and also a strategy of where to go next. And lastly, to the end users, you know, they know what the business processes are going to be like, and they're the ones actually going to provide feedback and what's actually also needed from them too. And now also on to you know the the what and the how uh, from from a strategic point of view you know we can definitely ensure the CRM changes uh, you know are basically supporting the the business goals and follow the IT best practice procedures release management wise we can think about design and document a complete release management process uh, thinking about design standards uh, following key standards for coding testing integration any large data volumes and so forth from quality control we can also talk about how we can create regular cadence of code reviews data inspections, uh, as well as analysis for code improvement as well, uh, from a communication strategy, you know, involving your leadership, making sure, you know, it comes from the top, so it comes down from the top down, so to speak, which channels we want to use, how frequently you want to communicate, what's the value of the users, and from a how perspective, so how we're going to actually make sure that governance is actually going to be honored and so forth, we can definitely have a look at uh, with an executive steering committee to uh, to review the overall project health, any KPIs that they would have, managing the budget, risk, vision, and the strategy, and from a project management um, community point of view as well to update any actions uh, resources and the team skills is there any project risk are they aligning with the key stakeholders and that's actually in attendance as well lots to consider but that's all, all part of how you can manage that data to, to the best of your abilities so they can be clever with it too so in summary how we can manage that data policy uh, from the quality and control you know, have a look at what systems your current source of truth uh, is currently being used and how you want to keep it updated. How often you may want to review and optimize that information as well. As well as from the governance perspective, you know, who is that going to, who's going to be owning that, that product? Who's going to be owning that data uh, from within the organization? How are we going to keep track of any new releases as well? And what standard procedures are going to be in place for your system or systems uh, to align with your overall strategy? And if you want to learn more, uh, please refer to the articles that we have that's currently on the page. And of course, you, you will be receiving this as a recording as well as the slides. Uh, and also uh, Salesforce's free online uh, platform trailhead, the modules that are linked are applicable to anyone, whether you are a Salesforce customer or not. So you can actually go on there right after this if you want to. 
Uh, and there are a few examples using Salesforce solutions, uh, but it offers the approach that you can take and what to consider as well. Uh, so the key takeaways from what we've seen today, you know, keeping your data clean, how we can set data types and validation rules, how to be clever with your data, uh, to from segmenting, gaining insights, and how we can you know create actions based on that, as well as how we can manage the data policy uh, from creating quality and quantity uh, control measures, uh, also to forming a governance procedure. Uh, and with that, Brenda, myself, and uh, the rest of FMP would like to thank you for your time and. Uh, Fiona, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Yang. Thanks, Brenda. That was great. Full of really great tips there about data management. I really appreciate that. Um, we are coming up to one o'clock. I think we probably do have time to answer um, a question or two if anybody wants to pop that into the Q&A box. Um, I can't see any of there right now, but then I haven't actually been able to access chat during this um, session. But I can, Brenda and Y, can you see, um, Brenda and Yang, can you see, see any questions in the Q&A box? No, okay. Jamie's saying no. So in which case I will just ask my own quick question if that's okay. And this is obviously, this is something that I have encountered in my role as a fundraiser as well. Can you provide a couple of tips on how to um, put in place some steps that give you the best chance of the team putting data into the database in a standardized way. Obviously, inputting data is open to human error and open, open to human variance, but what are your best um, chances of, of getting people to put it in in a standardized way? I'm happy to start off, Yang, if you want to join in later on. I think the first one is to define the type of data that you input as much as possible. So whether it be a number field, for example, or do you want to make sure that there is a certain character limit, for example, if it's um, some of the working with Turing check, for example, there are certain limits that you might want to define. Second is to think about whether you can use pick lists or multi pick lists as much as possible, because that helps you already define, predefine this information that avoids potential error. Um, and then the third is that you might want to look into some of these validation that uh, that you can put in place as well. So if this particular value doesn't align with what you're looking for, make sure there is an error message. But most importantly is to also help have a help text as well. So you want to make sure that people do look at the help text and be able to get an understanding of what kind of question you're looking for. So these are the three steps to think of. So data type, um, having restrictions by validation, and also using help text. Awesome. Thank you. Yang, did you want to add anything to that? I think that was a pretty well-rounded right. answer. And I'm sitting here wishing that I'd done some of those things when I was a fundraiser. <laughs> so thank you for answering that, um, Brenda. And I just wanted to ask one more quick question, and I think we might have to wrap up. Um, in terms of archiving old data, and, and you're right, there was, you know, it really blows out in CRMs. Um, where exactly does data go when it gets archived? And um, can you make a couple of suggestions about archiving tools? And they can be Salesforce ones if, if, if you want to. Sure, I won't be able to speak into details around where it goes um, because in the end, it ultimately depends on which um, solution that you are looking for. But essentially what you might want to think about um, is, I'm not sure if it will be helpful, is to um, look at what will be important for you to draw this data from. So for example, if it's a donor information, maybe you might want to keep their contact details and maybe their gift information. So looking into what it is that you want to be able to draw and whether that solution will allow you to then connect to your database and whether it be a manual process or maybe through a connection integration, be able to help you do that. Um, in terms of the solution itself as well, um, I think there is no stock standard solution as to which one you should go because you know, it ultimately comes down to, uh, again, what type of archiving solution you're looking for and what data you want to do. So for example, within Salesforce, we do have something called big objects that allows you to collect over the large amount of data within the system itself. But we also do have some of our app exchange, which is our uh, partner ecosystem. So you can go and download some of these apps from the marketplace. Own backup is something that is quite common across uh, nonprofits as well. And so something that you might want to take a look at. So this, um, there is a blog article on um, Fiona um, and also for all the, all the audience that I really find really helpful because it does list down a table of what data type it is, where you should do with it, um, what type of archiving option that you might want to consider. I think that would be a really good starting point. Um, otherwise, there will be, um, if you're interested in Salesforce solution, we do have um, technical architects who will be able to explain better as well on this one. 
Thanks, Brenda. Thank if we can grab that, um, that link from you, we will share it, uh, the blog article. We will share that in the post-webinar email. And finally, one really, really quick question. How many times a year um, would you recommend that people do a bit of an audit on their CRM slash wardrobe? That's a very great question. Yang, do you have any thoughts around this? Uh, at least once a year, definitely. Thanks. Maybe at the start of the year and just see how, how things are. So, you know, for instance, I've, I've worked with organizations in the past where they uh, standardized the addresses or they validated against the, the path, the, the personal address file from OzPost at the start of the year before, ideally before their uh, tax mailing. Sorry, it's, I haven't eaten since breakfast. Uh, so, so that ideally at least once a year. So you make sure, you know, it's standardized at least at the start of the year. I mean, you know, we can have it, you know, maybe twice a year as well. But that also comes down to cost as well. If there's a cost associated with it. So the organization will need to consider is it cost effective to be doing it on a regular basis? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you both, Yang and Brenda, for answering my questions there and for presenting us with so many tips and takeaways today. I really appreciate that. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. Um, we hope you got lots from the session. Um, the third and final uh, Salesforce Tech Thursday in this particular series will take place on Thursday, the 11th of August, I believe. Um, Jamie, please correct me in the chat box, got that wrong, but I believe it will be Thursday, the 11th of August. So we hope to see um, all of you there. Um, and thank you everyone for coming today. Have a good afternoon and the rest of your week. Thank you. Take care.